Welcome to the Medical Minute. We have a little bit different format today. Previously, we had people write in a question in their email and we would answer that question. Now what we're going to do is, in order to answer as many questions as possible, we're going to try to consolidate all the questions on a given subject and answer those all at the same time. So I have a list of questions that Michael has gotten me, and I'm going to try to go down this list and try to answer all the questions as succinctly as possible. And today's topic is on failure of instrumentation or uh, questions people have written in about broken hardware, broken rods and broken screws in the lumbar spine. So we're going to confine this to questions in the lump about the lumbar spine or the lower back. And this is about failure of instrumentation. So it's not going to be about misplaced instrumentation. Like if you've had a surgery someplace and the surgeon put a screw in the spinal canal or got a nerve, something like that, you may not want to watch this talk because we're not going to talk about this. This is just what does it mean if you've had a fusion and the rod is broken and the screw is broken? Is that an emergency? What should I do? Should I panic? What does it mean? And I have various questions that, uh, from individuals who have written in that seem to fall upon that subject. So when you think about implants in the body, metal implants in the body are extremely common. I think everybody knows somebody that has a heart valve or a pacemaker, hip replacement, knee replacement, broken arm or a leg. And as a rule of thumb, when you think about metal in the human body, it's considered to be inert, meaning retained hardware, rods and screws, or whatever metal device in the body is considered in the medical community to be of no consequence. It can stay in there forever, though I realize I'll probably get some emails on that because there's some different thoughts on that. But as a rule of thumb, if you have a metal plate fixing, for example, your arm or your leg, it does not have to come out. When we look at implants that are put in the human body, metal implants, as a rule of thumb, they fall into two major types. You have those types that are designed to last as long as possible. Now, anything made by humans that's made of metal has a limited life expectancy, but certain things, like if you think of a hip replacement or a knee replacement, those things are designed to last hopefully a lifetime. They may not, but they're designed to last as long as possible. Other things are essentially designed to fail, or the medical community understands that they may not last forever uh, and may need to be replaced or revised. And in some, time, in some cases, they are intentionally designed to fail. Um, so for example, if you break your leg, the surgeon can fix that leg by either putting a cast on the leg and immobilizing it. And by keeping those bones from moving, but in close proximity, you create an environment where those bones can heal back together. You can also do that by putting a rod down the middle of the legs, but down the middle of the leg and then putting a screw above and below the fracture and that will immobilize or keep the leg from moving um, just like a splint would on the outside, but you don't have to have the splint. In some cases though, the bone will not heal. And even though it's immobilized or even though you have a rod down the middle of the leg, the bones don't knit back together. So then what we do is we would have the patient begin walking on that leg. And as they walk on the leg, stress is placed on the leg and bone-like stress. The stress on the leg will eventually stimulate the bone to grow and hopefully the broken leg to unite. Now, if there's a screw in there, the screw may break. And if it breaks, then you even get more motion, more impact of the bone, and it should speed up the rate of healing. And basically the same thing happens in the human body when you talk about doing a lumbar fusion. If somebody is trying to fuse, for example, 
the bottom two bones in the back, L4 and L5, and you're trying to fuse those to the pelvis, what you'll do is you'll put rods and screws in those bones. And typically you'll put two screws in each bone, two in L4, two in L5, two in the pelvis, and then you'll put bone in there. And what happens is eventually those bones are gonna join into one big bone. So the bone will grow and four will connect to five, will connect to the pelvis. And once they fuse, then the rods and the screws are basically not doing anything. They're not taking up any stress. Um, in some cases, there will be what they call a delayed union. It won't heal. And if it doesn't heal, the rods will eventually fail. Now, once the rods fail or break or the screws break, now there is stress on those bones that stress may translate into those bones healing. So maybe the screws breaking was a good thing. And the screws break, the bones get pushed together, and you go ahead and you get a lumbar fusion. If it fuses, then you're back to the original situation, meaning you have retained rods and screws. Some are broken maybe, some are not, but it's considered in the medical community to be inert metal in the body. It's of no consequence. Um, let me make sure I'm answering everybody's question there. Um, if they don't feel, uh, now, is it dangerous to let to leave somebody with a broken screw? As I mentioned, no. If the screws break, the bone may therefore go ahead and heal. So it would not, in most cases would not be considered dangerous. And in fact, when the surgeon is initially planning a fusion, he does not have to put rods and screws in there. He could just put bone and let it heal, though the chance of healing is lower than would typically be acceptable in the United States, for example. In other countries, if you need a lumbar fusion, they may put just bone in there, accepting the fact that maybe 25% of the time, the bones won't heal. Putting rods and screws in there, you may get in the 90s, 96% chance of healing. So if your screws break, now you're basically in the situation, the instrumentation's not functioning and you're back to a standard type fusion without instrumentation, as would be done in much of even the industrialized world. Places like uh, in Canada, some, at least in the past, they've done lumbar fusions. They have socialized medicine, but they've done lum lumbar fusions without instrumentation, except a higher rate of fusion, but it still falls within the standard of care. That brings up another point. Nowadays, we use newer type of rods and screws. We use, for example, screws and rods made of titanium. That allows us to check and see if the bones have healed. So somebody may have had a fusion, they're a year out from the fusion, they still have pain. And one of the questions is, well, did the bones ever unite? Did they ever heal? With older rods and screws, there was not a way to tell. The only way we could tell was we would wait until the screws failed. If they broke, then we knew that it had not healed. And then we might either wait and watch and let them heal, or that now, now uh, tells us that because they had a non-union, maybe we should do something. In the past, the failure of instrumentation has been used as a way the surgeon is able to tell if in fact you have achieved a fusion or not, because we did not have other technology to check for that. Uh, let's see. Then another question we get, and there's several on this, and I'm gonna try to combine them all, but why did it happen? Everybody wants to know that. I have a broken screw. What happened? When you talk about placement of instrumentation in the spine, there's rods and screws in the spine. There's basically two major classifications. Somebody may have been in a motor vehicle accident. They've broken a bone. And in that case, the surgeon has to design what they call a construct. He has to design something that's going to hold that bone in place until it heals. He may put 
three screws up in the thoracic spine, two down in the lumbar spine, connect them, cross bridges, whatever. But sometimes the surgeon will design a construct that is inferior. It does not do the job and it therefore fails. In the case of a lumbar fusion, that's not as common because the construct used by the surgeon to fuse, for example, L4 to L5 to the sacrum is virtually the same construct in all surgeries. Every surgeon uses the same construct. It's a standard construct. So it would be hard to say, well, uh, this surgeon put two screws in four, two in five, and two in the sacrum, and it failed. He should have done something differently. Well, everyone does it that way. So it's usually not due to the way the surgeon placed the instrumentation, but it would be due to some other factor. Other factors could be, um, for example, what was used to make it fuse. Did they use bone from the hospital, bank bone? Did they use stem cells? Did they use hormones? Uh, they have special corals they can use. There's a whole bunch of different uh, types of materials that can be used to help something fuse. Many times that's not in the hands of the surgeon. So for example, um, if you buy, and I'll try not to mention any specific insurances, but different insurances tell the surgeon what he can use. Some major insurances in the US, well-known things may just allow the surgeon to use cadaver bone. Um, maybe in the neck, if you're gonna have a cervical fusion, uh, you can't use stem cells, you can't use uh, plastic cages. Uh, it has to be cadaver bone. Well, that's gonna have a higher rate of non-union, but still acceptable. Um, and in some cases in the neck, even with cadaver bone, the results are so good that in the 90 percentile fusion rate. So it may not be that big a deal. Um, so it's usually not the con construct that's used that would cause it to fail, um, but it would be some other factors such as the substance chosen, which may or may not be in the hands of the surgeon or the patient. Um, even I'll have patients come in demanding stem cells, but if they, um, have an insurance that doesn't pay for those, then they're going to get what they've what their insurance says. And then another thing would be just patient related factors, meaning um, is the patient sick? Does the patient have diabetes? Does the patient smoke? Maybe the patient didn't follow the appropriate post operative protocol. All of those could play a role. I think I answered that good. And then the last one uh, is uh, people want to know what you do or how you treat it. Uh, different treatment options. So you go to the surgeon. You've got a rod or a screw that's broken. What are the different treatment options he can offer you? Well, one is the fact that the screw broke and it healed. So maybe you don't need anything. So the treatment is going to be based upon your level of symptoms. If you are asymptomatic and you're doing fine, you're pretty much done. You don't need surgery. Now, if you have not healed and you still have pain, then the surgeon has basically one of two options he can do. One is what they call an exchange. You take out the old screws and you put in new screws. And they have new screws that are designed and sets that are designed for just that situation. Typically, they're bigger diameter screws that are designed to carry more weight. Um, and the other option would be take the metal out, refuse it, but just using bone. I think that's probably the most common option, and that's usually what we do. If somebody has had a fusion, four to the sacrum, and it hasn't healed, like say at four or five, Many times we will just take the old instrumentation out and then where the instrumentation was, the body has developed um, a space. We can now take advantage of that space, filling that space where the instrumentation used to be with um, bank bone, stem cells, usually stem cells, so that it will go ahead and fuse. And it's based upon the idea that um, somebody had a fusion with rods and screws, the screws broke. 
Maybe it didn't completely heal. Maybe it didn't sol uh, solidly fuse, but it has developed a lot of inherent stability. So it's not now so unstable, it needs rods and screws. So you can take that out, take advantage of the space where the rods and screws used to be and fill that space full of stem cells. Um, and I think I answered probably how many emails there? Probably 15 or so, hopefully. And I think I did a pretty good job. Michael, can you think of anything I've left out or anybody's questions that I haven't uh, answered? Now we have a lot of questions, but not on that subject. That was pretty much most of them. Yeah, I tried to cut. Today we're trying to cover all those about hardware failure. If you have any additional questions, if you, uh, anything that I may have left out or I didn't answer your specific question, please uh, say something in the comments below and I will try to answer those questions. Um, or if you have any other thoughts or you think I was incorrect on something, please let me know. Um, and uh, the most important thing, remember to subscribe. And I think that's it. Have a good day. Thank you for watching.